is changing yes. to? Yes, when it says uh, 648. Okay. Is there any new? Nothing yeah. new. We're, we're coming in in silence. Is the only thing. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, my name is Daryl Prophet. For those of you who do not know me, I'm the interim rector here. We just finished a town hall meeting, so we're gradually coming over from the other building. Um, there's a couple of changes in the bulletin this morning that I'll come up. I'll let you know a couple of hymn changes uh, that I will let you know at the time. Uh, but in the meantime, one of the things we've been doing, or I've been asking folks to do, is I want to create a sense of uh, interest about this church in the, in, among your friends and, and acquaintances. And one of the ways to do that is to check in on your social media. And people might have a question. There's uh, been several great conversations that have taken place because of that. So if you do have social media, you're not worried about letting people know you're here so they'll go to your house and steal your bicycle. Uh, but if you're not worried about that, you check in and that might create a question that you could respond to. So it's a beautiful day. The pollen is terrible, but, uh, but it is a beautiful day. I am thrilled to worship in this place with you. I encourage you to enter into worship at whatever level you feel comfortable. We're going to start in silence since it is Lent, uh, but let me tell you that uh, it's, the Sundays are not Sundays in Lent. They're Sundays of Lent. In other words, it's, even on Sundays during Lent, it's still Easter. We still celebrate the resurrection. That's such a big deal. So, having said that, why don't you stand and just briefly say hello to someone sitting next to you or in the same row, and let it, let's enter into a worship of an amazing God. Bless the Lord, who forgives all our sins. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open. All desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and wordly magnify your holy name, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen.
The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, you know that we have no power in ourselves to help ourselves. Keep us both outwardly in our bodies and inwardly in our souls, that we may be defended from all adversities which may happen to the body and from all evil thought, thoughts which may assault and hurt the soul. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you, and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. I encourage you to be seated for the reading of the lesson. A reading from the book of Exodus. Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law, Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led his flock beyond the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire of a bush. He looked at the bush, and the bush was blazing, yet it was not consumed. Then Moses said, I must turn aside and look at the great sight and see why the bush is not burned up. When the Lord saw that he had turned aside to see, God called, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses, and he said, here I am. Then he said, come no closer, remove the sandals from your feet for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. He said further, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I have observed the misery of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard their cry on account of their taskmasters. Indeed, I know their sufferings, and I have come down to deliver them from the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land to good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey, to the country of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Pezzarites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites. The cry of the Israelites has now come to me. I have also seen how the Egyptians oppressed them. So come, I will send you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? He said, I will be with you. This shall be the sign for you that is I who sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall worship God on this mountain. But Moses said to God, if I come to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your ancestors has sent me to you, and they ask me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. He said further, thus you shall say to the Israelites, I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, thus you shall say to the Israelites, the Lord, the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever. And this is my title for all generations. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I read Psalm 63 responsibly through whole, whole verse. O oh God, you are my God, eagerly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you and my flesh faints for you as a barren and dry land where there is no water. Therefore I gazed upon you in your holy place that I might behold your power and your glory. 
For your loving kindness is better than life itself. My lips shall give you praise. So will I bless you as long as I live, and lift up my hands in your name. My soul is content as with marrow and fatness, and my mouth praises you with joyful lips. For you have been my helper, and under the shadow of your wings I will rejoice. Our sequence hymn is hymn number 648. 648. Jesus Christ according to Luke. Glory to you, Lord Christ. At that time, there were some present who told Jesus about the Galileans, whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. He asked them, Do you think that because these Galileans suffered in this way, they were worse sinners than all other Galileans? No. I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all perish as they did. Are those 18 who were killed when the Tower of Shalom fell on them? Do you think that they were worse offenders than all the others living in Jerusalem? No. I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all perish just as they did. Then he told this parable. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came looking for fruit on it and found none. So he said to the gardener, see here, for three years I have come, down, I have come looking for fruit on this fig tree, and still I find none. Cut it down. Why should it be wasting the soil? He replied, sir, let it alone for one more year until I dig around it and put manure on it. If it bears fruit next year, well and good. But if not, you can cut it down. And this is the gospel of the Lord. Praise you.
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Nobody saw me pour that water all the way down in front of me. <laughs> There's a lot in the gospel story about tragedy and what tragedy might mean to us. We all face tragedy, both personally and as a people. So we can ask the question, what does it mean to us? One of the questions a lot of people ask, and I've heard this for over 30 years as a priest, people ask, is God getting even with me? You know, the question is, do, do tragedies reveal a God who is wrathful and seeking to punish us? Now, as I, I put this sermon together, I thought, there's a chance that somebody might check out before I get to the end. So just in case you're one of those people, let me answer that question up front. And the gospel will underline the truth of this. No, God is not seeking to punish us. That's not what Jesus is saying. In fact, he's saying something very important to each of us about where God is when the world is set on fire, either collectively or individually. You see, when it comes to tragedies, I find it easy to put my focus on war, especially when it's far away from me. Now, I gotta admit, I experience frustration when I've gotta pay more to fill up my gasoline tank in the car, but when it's something far from me, it keeps me from any self-examination that I might be forced to do. In a way, this is what the questioner is, is doing when he asks Jesus about these two events that are recounted for us in this morning's gospel. You see, the questioner refuses to focus on anything that might cause any sort of self-reflection. I suspect that the questioner hoped Jesus would go after Pilate, that first century authoritarian leader who ruled with violence and terror. But Jesus seems to ignore Pilate in his response. And what he does, he turns the table on the crowd in order to make this personal. And it's not just personal for them. It is for us as well. Jesus asked the crowd if those who had been innocently killed were worse sinners than others because of the suffering they endured. Now, most of the crowd wrongly understood punishments were from God, especially the kind these Galileans faced. And they were directly, they thought, proportionate to the crime or sin people committed, God would respond with equal force, equal wrath. In other words, the more you sin, the more you will be punished. Sound familiar? You ever heard that? Or as Jesus asked, do you think that because these Galileans suffered in this way, because they were worse sinners than all other Christ uh, Galileans? And then to make his point even clearer, he brings into the conversation another event that had taken place. 18 people had been crushed under a tower in Jerusalem and had died. We don't know a lot about that. We think it was about a Roman revolt. But it was a rather random event. And the prevailing theology of the day that Jesus was now confronting would have suggested that random events like both were evidence of God's retribution. Jesus is addressing that. With, and you know, the fact is with friends like that, who needs enemies, right? Yet I, I can't tell you how many times I have heard countless people suggest that God is the one responsible for similar horrific of tragedies. You see, I'm old enough to remember that some so-called preachers blame the tragedy following Hurricane Katrina as divine retribution on New Orleans, right? 
Now, I don't want to wish, I don't want to list other such accusations, but there are many, many people who believe that God is actively punishing people for random, in random acts of violence and tragedy that have happened through the years. But listing them isn't important. What's important is how Jesus responds. He emphatically says, no, this isn't why these things happen. You know, it's ironic to me at least that the remainder of this morning's gospel is often twisted to miss the point that Jesus is making. You see, at first blush, it sounds like Jesus is saying, unless you repent, you're going to find the same divine retribution. This is a classic reason why you should not form a theology around a verse. But we need to go deeper. We need to be motivated by what we know is what all scripture points to, the unmerited, all scripture points to this, the unmerited, undeserved love of God available to all. Jesus does say, does he not, that the crowd needs to repent. Now it's important that we not get confused about what that means. The word here is metanoia. And I love that word. In fact, right after Al Gore created the internet and I had my first AOL.com uh, email, my email address was metanoia at AOL.com. It's long been lost, but I always liked the word metanoia. It made me sit, feel like I was smart. It's a Greek word. And it literally means though, not what you might think it means. It literally means to change your mind change your mind. Jesus is saying here, and this is important, Jesus is saying that the crowd's understanding about injustice and unrighteousness is wrong. God is not the author of either. And when he says that unless they change their mind, they risk dying just like the people in the two examples. But hold on a second. This means that unless they change their minds, they risk dying suddenly and unprepared. See, there's no promise. I know prosperity preachers will tell you this, but it's not true. There's no promise that we can avoid death, even one that might be as tragic and catastrophic as the two examples that are described. People die sometimes in tragic situations. Before I came here to Holy Comforter, I was the chaplain at the fire department, the Wakarusa Fire Department. And I was called late one night, about 10, 11 o'clock at night for these young kids. They're most young boys and girls in their early 20s had come up on a car accident. And the car accident killed a family of five with three babies in it. And, and the firefighters were, were struggling with that. And they asked me, why would God do this? That's what we face. That's why theology, bad theology, is horrific. It's awful. That's why we go deeper to find out what's meaning here. There is no promise that we can avoid death. We can't avoid tragic and catastrophic as the two examples that are described. But, he says, if you change your mind about how God is present in the world, even during cataclysmic catastrophes, you can be prepared for whatever you face. And our lives will bear fruit that come directly from both an understanding and an experience of God's love. God's love, even and most especially in the context of suffering and death, is available in an intense way. Folks, I know this personally. I lost my son. My son died unexpectedly. Was in the hospital just for a few days. He died. And oh, it just nailed me for a long time. And suddenly, I faced that. And gradually, I had to come to terms with where, I had to ask the question myself, where is God? And as I emerged through all this grief, what I found out was God was most present with me in the midst of the suffering, in the midst of the loss. Jesus shares a parable 
about a fig tree that has not produced fruit in three years. The significance of fruit bearing, by the way, is a theme throughout Luke. John the Baptist preaching in Luke chapter 3 describes just interpersonal dealings as the fruit of repentance. In the Sermon on the Plain that Jesus did in Luke chapter 6, Jesus states that a good tree produces good fruit and similarly a good person produces good from the goodness of their heart. And then in the parable of the sower in Luke chapter 8, Jesus explains that those with good hearts hear the word of God, hold fast to it, and patiently produce fruit. So with that evidence, we know the fig tree that Jesus mentions represents the human heart. And how easy it is to spend our lives, is it not, on how bad other people are. And we fail to live our lives in such a way that bears good fruit. And how do you live a life like that? By being loving and accepting and allying ourselves to those the world rejects. We cannot bear fruit, such fruit, when we are constantly taking everything that happens and making it about ourselves or assigning fault to others because of the way they live. This is wrong. And like a fruitless fig tree, we simply waste our opportunity to be a part of the plan God is unfolding before us. Loving the unlovable, standing alongside the rejected. You know one of the reasons I think we have trouble loving what the world would call unlovable? Because we see ourselves in them and we don't love ourselves. Sometimes we take, need to take a close examination of what, what is it that you struggle with? Why can't you love those people? What is it about your own self that needs to change? Jesus is not addressing and will refuse to address the specifics of the tragedies that were mentioned, but he uses them as a springboard to face the existential questions of our existence why God put us here, and how we should look to God during struggles, suffering, racism, wars, and unrest. Where is God, we probably ask. As I said, God is in the suffering and the loss. God is with the mother and unborn child and family but the mother and unborn child who were killed in the bombing at the Ukra in the Ukrainian hospital. God is with those who wait in waiting rooms as their child faces an uncertain surgery. God is there as he was with Julie and me, grieving parents as we watched our adult son leave this world, connected to an IV machine and intubated. God is with those clinging to life who have been invaded by a virus that now keeps them from breathing. No one sinned to cause such struggle. If that's what we believe, we need to have our minds changed or to use the words Jesus did, we need to experience metanoia for God understands our suffering. Not in just a way where he acknowledges our suffering, but God is physically and emotionally present in our loss and suffering. God participates with us in our struggles. The very first sermon I preached after my son, our son died, was on a Good Friday. I didn't think I could make it. I made it to the Monday Thursday service and left early. And I came and I had to preach on Good Friday. It was a huge service in this church. We always sometimes had two, three hundred people come to Good Friday. And I had to stand up and I had to preach after having lost my son. Never did I ever understand the grief of the Father's heart than I did that day. But never did I ever see God saying to me, I am with you in your loss. I suffer with you. That's why I never, never questioned the goodness of God because he walked with me. He walked with Julie. He walked with Emily, Joseph's 
sister. He walked with John, Joseph's brother. He walked with us. He continues to walk with us. He participates. He's not immune. It's not like he's a God up on a throne somewhere and just saying to us, I hope you all get over this because the goodness which will be revealed will be so great that you'll forget all about that. He doesn't do that. He participates in the suffering. He shares in the suffering. The smallest verse in the New Testament, you know what that is. When Jesus goes up late, shows up late to Lazarus, Mary and Martha's brother, he shows up late and Lazarus is dead when he shows. Jesus doesn't say, ah, not a big deal, watch what I can do. He doesn't say, oh, this is all part of, he's gonna show up in the gospel one day, this is pretty cool. No, he looks at the scene. He knows he's going to raise Lazarus from the grave. But you know what he does? He looks at all the grief. And the shortest verse in the New Testament is then written for us. It just simply said, after Jesus looked upon all the grief, it says, quote, Jesus wept. I serve a God who weeps with me. I serve a God who loves me so much. He won't abandon me to that grief. He'll walk every step of the way with me, with you. God is there. When we get our mind and our heart around this, we, we come. We come to a basic understanding that we are called. See, it, it changed me. I, I'm, not, I'm not the same person I was before my son died. It changed me. I'm much more loving. I'm much more accepting. I'm much more inclusive. You know why? Because God changed my mind. I saw him. He changed my mind. And he says to this to me, Walk with those who struggle. Love those people by be willing to participate with them in their suffering, just like Jesus does. How that happens is going to be different from person to person and situation to situation. But removing ourselves from the struggle of others or even worse, to blame their struggles on God, somehow causes, causing that loss is to be exactly like a barren fig tree. Folks, I, you know, I, I, I don't know how much time I have left with you, but I want to be really honest with you this morning. And I want to tell you that at the end of my priesthood, when I took early retirement and moved back to Kansas, I was a barren fig tree, not because of my loss, but because of my attitude about others. I was a barren fig tree and God watered me and watered me and encouraged me and changed me. And now I know what it's like to love people that the world rejects. I know what it's like to include people that is so easy to exclude. I traded a moment to have Joseph back, but I don't get Joseph back, not yet. But I'm so grateful that I am no longer a barren fig tree and I pray for you if you're in that position to understand that we are not just to say to people who struggle, buck up, God loves you, one day there'll be heaven. No, we are to struggle with them. We are to walk with them. We are to shed tears with them. We are to include when they might be excluded. I read this week, that Jesus is saying here, he's, he, he's basically, is he, the question is, is he talking about Galileans and Judeans going to hell? And the answer to what I read was yes and no. Jesus isn't talking about a post-mortem spiritual hell, but an impending literal hell. Jesus has been calling Jerusalem up to this point into, a, into the kingdom of God, which is the way of peace. And you, the way you get into the kingdom of God by the way of peace is by practicing enemy love and radical forgiveness. Radical forgiveness. But for the most part, Jerusalem has rejected this message of peace. 
believing instead that when the time comes, God will fight with them in a war of independence and help them attain freedom by killing their enemies. In response to this enormously dangerous holy war assumption, Jesus warns Jerusalem against resorting to violence by telling them that if they don't rethink war and peace according to the kingdom of God, they're all going to die by Roman swords and collapsing buildings. And that is exactly what happened a generation later. After four years of violent revolution, led by a cadre of false messiahs claiming that God was about to give Israel victory over Rome, General Titus and the Roman 10th Legion marched on Jerusalem. And on August 4th, AD 70, after a brutal four-month siege, the Romans launched their final assault. Hell had come to the holy city. Buildings collapsed from the bombardment of catapult stones. The city was set ablaze and hundreds of thousands of Jerusalem citizens were killed by Roman swords. And in the end, Jerusalem was, was reduced to a smoldering Gehenna, which is often translated as hell. But Gehenna literally was the garbage dump outside of Jerusalem where the fires were never quenched and the maggots never died. This was when Jerusalem went to hell. In the 21st century, the Satan still tells big lies. The Satan told me that it was my failures in ministry that made me lose my son. A lie, a big lie. The Satan still tells those. In the age of nuclear, chemical, and biological weapons capable of eradicating all of human life, the way of war is still foolishly romanticized and deemed a legitimate way to shape the world. But Lent is a time to repent, to rethink, to reimagine today. Let us heed the warnings of Jesus and remember that there is no way to peace. Peace is the way. Wars and rumors of wars will always be with us until the, king, kingdom, until the kingdom arrives in its fullness. Struggles, sufferings, the innocent dying among us, losing family members, yes, even losing children, will always be with us until the kingdom comes in its fullness. God is not punishing. God desires to love you more than you are willing to be loved. It was true with me. So don't lose hope. God calls us to work for justice, pray for peace, and love, love, love everyone. And guess what? This I too know from the depth of my soul, and I pray that it'll be my last words. If God is on our side, Who can be against us? That is a place to live and to love and to forgive. Amen. Let us stand and recite the ancient creed of the church. We believe in one God. Father Almighty, Maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen, we believe in one Lord, Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten of our name, of one being with the Father, who in him all things remain, for us and for our salvation, he became known. 
With all our heart and with all our mind, let us pray to the Lord, saying, Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above, for the loving kindness of God, and for the salvation of our souls, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the world, for the welfare of the Holy Church of God, and for the unity of all peoples, let us pray to the Lord. For our bishop and for all the clergy and people, let us pray to the Lord. For our president, for the leaders of the nations, and for all in authority, let us pray to the Lord. For this city, for every city and community, and for those who live in them, let us pray to the Lord. For seasonable weather and for an abundance of the fruits of the earth, let us pray to the Lord. For the good earth which God has given us and for the wisdom and will to conserve it, let us pray to the Lord. For those who travel on land, on water, or in the air, or through outer space, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have For the aged and infirm, for the widowed and orphans, and for the sick and the suffering, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the poor and the oppressed, for the unemployed and the destitute, for prisoners and captives and for all who remember and care for them, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For all who have died in the hope of resurrection and for all the departed, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For deliverance from all danger, violence, oppression, and deg degradation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. That we end our lives in faith and hope and without suffering and without reproach, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Defend us, deliver us, and in thy compassion protect us, O Lord, by thy grace. Lord, have mercy. In the communion of saints, let us commend ourselves and one another and all, and all our life to Christ our God. To thee, O Lord our God. Heavenly Father, ruler of all things in heaven and earth, mercifully accept the prayers of your people and strengthen us to do your will through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Please share the peace of God with peace. one another. I don't know why when we pass a piece around here, I think of Richard Nixon. <laughs> uh, Rick's coming up to uh, give a...
some announcements from the vestry as we're, we're now, it's our tradition to do so. Standing behind me is the basket uh, that has a couple of uh, packages of, of uh, peanut butter and jelly, and that's what we're collecting over the next several weeks. So I ask God's blessing on this. May this offering meet the needs of those who most need it, and we may meet do more than identify with these people, but also walk alongside them. In Jesus' name, amen. And I don't know, isn't a ladybird, uh, I mean, a, uh, a ladybug the sign of the resurrection? Is that, has anybody ever heard that? You know, instead of letting balloons out, you get, gather ladybugs and let them out, maybe on Pentecost or something, I don't know. Anyway, we've got a ladybug on the altar there. I noticed that while ago, I think. I'm just gonna take that as a sign of good things. So, speaking of a sign of good things, my friend Rick. Good morning. I'm Rick Harris, a member of your vestry. A it? few announcements. Uh, last Friday was another wonderful gathering yes. with Bingo Night. <laughs> uh, great, time, great time was had by all, and just look forward to the next event in April. Uh, prior to the service, uh, a number of you were in our town hall meeting where we discussed the uh, results of the um, of the Holy Cow survey. That uh, information is also on our website. Uh, it was a wonderful, healthy discussion, and I'm even more excited about uh, where we're heading as we, we seek a new rector. Speaking of that, today is the deadline of nominations for serving on the search committee. So if you are, are uh, so interested, please get your nomination forms in. They're found online. There's also some forms out in the, in the Narthex. The, uh, uh, look, look at the announcements here and also on the website. There are so many things happening, especially during our Linton journey. Uh, we put things on pause this morning for the town hall meeting, but there are a number of ways to become involved. And finally, don't forget lunch brunch uh, today following this service. Thank you all. Thank you, Rick. Offer to God a sacrifice of thanksgiving and make good your vows to the Most High. Don't kill my friend here. <laughs>
The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. God of all power, ruler of the universe, you are worthy of glory and praise. At your command, all things came to be. The vast expanse of interstellar space, galaxies, suns, the planets in their courses, and this fragile earth, our island home. From the primal elements, you brought forth the human race and blessed us with memory, reason, and skill. You made us the rulers of creation. But we turned against you and betrayed your trust, and we turned against one another. Again and again, you called us to return. Through prophets and sages, you revealed your righteous law, and in the fullness of time. You sent your only son, born of a woman, to fulfill your law, to open for us the way of freedom and peace. And therefore we praise you, joining with the heavenly chorus, with prophets, apostles, and martyrs, and with all those in every generation who have looked to you in hope, to proclaim with them your glory in their unending hymn. And so, Father, we who have been redeemed by him and made a new people by water and the Spirit, now bring before you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be the body and blood of Jesus Christ, our Lord. On the night he was, hand, he was betrayed, he took bread, said the blessing, broke the bread, and gave it to his friends and said, take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, gave thanks and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins whenever you drink it. Do this for the remembrance of me. Remembering now his work of redemption and offering to you the sacrifice of thanksgiving. We celebrate his death and resurrection as we await the day of his coming. Lord God of our fathers, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, open our eyes to see your hand at, the wor at work in the world about us. Deliver us from the presumption of coming to this table for solace only and not for strength, for pardon only and not for renewal. Let the grace of this Holy Communion make us one body, one spirit in Christ, that we may worthily serve the world in his name. Accept these prayers and praises, Father, through Jesus Christ, our great high priest, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit, your church gives honor, glory, and worship from generation to generation. Amen. And now as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done 
on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. These are the gifts of God for you, the people of God. Let me remind you that you can come forward without receiving communion for a blessing by simply folding your arms like this. And then we also have gluten-free bread just as a reminder to fold, put your hands like this instead of like this. That'll remind me to give you the gluten-free bread. Thank you. of Christ, the bread of heaven. Turn my microphone off.
Let us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart through Christ our Lord. Amen. And I ask you to join with me in the prayer for Holy Comforter as we seek a new rector. Almighty God, as we wait for a new priest to lead us and to walk with us, we ask you to guide us as we wait. Bless all who serve in the congregation, especially the vestry and Walter, our senior warden, Father Darrell, our interim priest, and those who have the responsibility to lead us in the call process. Grant us strength and patience. Help us remember that you're always with us and that you always provide for our needs. These things we ask through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Go forth into the world in peace. Be of good courage. Hold fast that which is good. Render to no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the afflicted. Show love to everyone. Love and serve the Lord. Rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit and the blessing of Almighty God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Just to keep you on your toes, we've changed the hymn, uh, the recessional hymn is 152. Let me hear you sing loudly. forth in the name of Christ.